everyone! Um, so the aim of the next 10 minutes or so is just going to be to review what choice functions are and to review some of the choice rules that we talked about in lecture this week. And when we meet synchronously on Friday, we'll just jump straight into some practice problems involving the different choice rules that are being reviewed here. Okay, so let's start out by just talking about what a choice function is. So a choice function is going to be a function that takes as an input a decision problem with a menu of options and outputs a set of choice-worthy options. So here um, I've drawn out a decision. So um, we formally we write out the decision like this. So we have a decision D and in order to have a well-posed decision problem, we need to specify the outcomes, the actions, and the states in that decision problem. So we write that as a table um, in a table form as follows. So suppose that um, my friend asks me what coffee I want or like what, what, what drink I want, and they're going to decide which coffee shop they go to, and I have no control over that. All I can do is pick what drink I want. So that this is the that that's the, the decision that's represented in this table. So I have four options: black coffee, latte, tea, and iced coffee. There are three possible um, coffee shops that my friend could go to: Lab, Literati, and Sweetwaters. Those are the states because those are things that I don't have control over. And then in the table, the O one, O two, O three, etc. Those are the outcomes. So that's going to be um, like the utility I get from getting each, uh, any given beverage at one of the coffee shops. So a choice function is going to take all of this information as its input and give us a choice set, um, C of A, which is a subset of A, A being all of these actions that are available to me which contains all and only the choice worthy actions given the agent's reasons. So the thought is, is that um, CFA, the choice set, is going to be a subset of these four options. And the subset is going to be all and only the choice worthy options given this menu that we have. Now, we don't want just any old action to go into our choice set with choice worthy actions, right? We are only going to want the choice worthy actions to go in that set. So given that, we're going to want to impose some constraints on the actions that can go in the choice set. And that's the aim of specifying all the choice rules that we're going to be talking about now. The question is, what choice rules do we want to have for determining whether or not an action makes it into the choice set? So here are some um, desirable principles for us deciding what options go into the choice set. Here's a pretty plausible starting assumption for us coming up with these principles for our choice rules. Context independence. That says the only things that matter for choice worthiness are the agent's credences about likely states of the world and her desires for outcomes. What context independence is saying is that it shouldn't matter what options are in our menu for deciding how desirable a given option is, right? Um, so it shouldn't matter what's in the menu, the desirability of an option should stay the same regardless of what other options there are. Starting from that assumption, we can get um, some pretty cool principles. Um, these first three are due to Amartya Sen. So first is principle alpha. Principle alpha says that any act that is choice worthy in D remains choice worthy in any contraction of D that contains A. So a contraction of a decision problem is going to be a, a decision problem that has a subset of the menu of options in the larger decision table. Um, so only options are eliminated in um, contractions, not states. So we only delete rows, not columns. So here's an example that illustrates this principle. Here is the um, original decision problem above, D. So we have four options here, black coffee, latte, tea, and iced coffee. Let's say that black coffee and tea are the choice worthy options in this decision problem. What principle alpha says is that if we have a contraction of D um, uh, here, so um, D with that like arrow pointing down, this is a contraction of the problem because the menu of options contains a subset of the menu of, the, of options from the larger decision table. 
Principle alpha tells us that any act A that was choice worthy in this larger table is going to remain choice worthy in the contraction. So we know that because black coffee is in the larger decision table and it's choice worthy, it's also going to be choice worthy in this contraction of it. Now, if T were here, it would be choice worthy, but T um, is not in this contraction. So in this contraction, there's only one choice worthy option. Here is a second principle, principle beta. Principle beta says that when options are added to D, um, so in an expansion of D, either all choice worthy actions will remain choice worthy or none of them will. So once again, here is our original decision table. And we have four options where black coffee and tea are the choice worthy options. Now here's an expansion of D. So um, D is a subset of um, this larger decision problem. So here we have all the same four options as before, but with an additional option, soda. And the thought here is this. It will either be the case that black coffee and tea remain choice worthy in this expansion of the problem, or it's going to be the case that soda is the new winner. And it must be one of those two things. So here's something that is implausible on principle beta. It's implausible that only T will be the choice worthy option. Adding soda into the mix shouldn't affect your indifference between black coffee and tea as the choice worthy options um, in the decision problem. So once again, either both black coffee and tea will be the winners of this new decision problem or soda will. Principle R is the principle that falls directly out of principle alpha and principle beta. And principle R says this, if A is choice worthy in some decision problem D1, where B is an option, and B is choice worthy in some decision problem D2, where A is an option, then both A and B are choice worthy in both decision problems. Okay, so here we have two different decision problems, D1 and D2. Now let's say in D1, black coffee is choice worthy, and there are three options. In decision problem two, there are five options and T is choice worthy. Notice that both um, the choice worthy options in the decision problem, so black coffee and T, are present in both of the decision problems. So here T is present and here black coffee is present. What R says is that this current setup is bad. <laughs> right, because in this first decision problem, black coffee and tea are both present, but only black coffee is choice worthy. And in the second decision problem, both black coffee and tea are present again, but only tea is marked as choice worthy. So principle R tells us that in order for this to make sense, it must be the case that in this first decision problem, tea is also choice worthy. And in this second decision problem, black coffee is also choice worthy. So um, once again, if you have a decision problem where some option A is choice worthy and B is an option, and another decision problem where again you have the same options A and B, and B is choice worthy, then it has to be the case that both A and B are choice worthy in the decision problems. Consistency is another principle that falls out of principles alpha and beta. So consistency says that if A is strictly preferred to B, that implies that A is weakly preferred to B, and it is not the case that B is strictly preferred to A. And consistency also says that if A is weakly preferred to B, that implies that B is not preferred to A. Okay. So the thought here being that, um, let's say here's once again our decision problem. Now let's say that we strictly prefer black coffee to all the other options. So if we strictly prefer black coffee to a latte, that means that um, the payoff from getting black coffee is going to be um, greater than getting it for a latte. Now what, um, so that's strict preference. Now what weak preference means is that it's either the case that you strictly prefer one option to another or that you're indifferent between them. So if it's the case that you strictly prefer black coffee to a latte, so um, drinking a black coffee gives you a higher payoff than getting a latte, 
then um, it's going to triv trivially also be the case that um, you are either um, always happier getting a black coffee than a latte or you're indifferent between them. So that's why strict preference implies weak preference. A strict preference for A over B also entails that B is not strictly preferred to A because that would be a contradiction, right? If you um, always prefer A to B, so A, the, the payoff of A is greater than the payoff of B, then it can't be the case that the payoff of B is greater than the payoff of A. The last choice rule we're going to talk about right now is transitivity. Transitivity actually doesn't follow from principles alpha and beta um, for reasons that we've talked about, but I'm also happy to discuss that more with you if you're interested. So um, instead, we're just going to get transitivity by introducing a new principle that doesn't follow straight out of principles alpha and beta. Okay, so here's what principle T says. If A is choice worthy in some decision D, where B is an option, and if B is choice worthy, oh, sorry, in some decision D1, where B is an option, and if B is choice worthy in some decision D2, where C is an option, then A is choice worthy in the decision whose option menu contains everything in D1 and D2. Okay, so here are two sets of actions. A1 contains the options black, coffee, and latte. Now let's say that the choice function that spits out all and only the choice worthy options from that set just contains black coffee. So black coffee is the choice worthy option in this decision. Now a second set of actions contains three options, tea, latte, and iced coffee, and the choice function that spits out all and only the choice worthy options from that decision are latte and tea. So there's a tie here between latte and tea, they are equally good options in this decision. What principle T says is that if we have a third set of actions that contains all of the options in the first two decisions, so um, this will contain black coffee, latte, tea, um, we won't double count latte, so we'll skip that, and iced coffee. Okay, so um, this is a decision whose option menu contains everything in D1 and D2, then A is going to be the choice worthy option in this decision. So um, the choice function of A3 is going to contain um, just the one um, that won out from the first decision problem. So in this first um, menu, we have black coffee and latte and black coffee won. Notice that latte is in the second menu and it's one of the choice worthy options here. But we know that black coffee is preferred to latte. So um, because black coffee won out against the winner in the second problem, we know that black coffee is going to be the preferred option in this third decision problem that contains everything in the first two decision problems. So remember that transitivity is the principle um, that if um, A is strictly or weakly preferred to B, um, so both strict and weak preference are transitive, but I'm just going to write this out as strict preference for clarity. So if A is strictly preferred to B and um, B is strictly preferred to C, then A is strictly preferred to C. Now transitivity is super important and definitely a constraint that we want to impose on our preferences because as we've seen, if you have intransitive preferences, then you're susceptible to being pumped for your money, right? <laughs> so we don't want to get into that situation where people can pump us for money. So we want to have transitive preferences. And this fact follows pretty straightforwardly from um, principle T. So by introducing principle T, we guarantee ourselves this principle of transitivity, which is awesome. All right, so I'll see you all in section on Friday and we'll be doing some fun practice problems involving these different principles.